two, one. What's up, Falcons fans, and welcome to episode eight of Talking Birdie, an Atlanta Falcons podcast powered by sportstalkatl.com. I am your host, Matt Carley. You can find me on Twitter at Matt Carley. Carley spelled K-A-R-O-L-Y. I'm joined as usual by my two co-hosts from the Sports Talk ATL team, Jake Gordon, Alex Lord. How we doing, fellas? Doing well. Good. Just uh, yeah, just living the dream. I guess that's what all the old people that work nine to five say, right? So I'm just kidding. <laughs> Def- definitely, you know, a good day following uh, a big Hawks win, come from behind win. It's 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 great to be on that side of things, uh, you know, as Atlanta sports fans. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're Falcons just got finished uh, their last open to the media off-season session on Monday. We're recording this like we normally do on Tuesday, June fifteenth, and and so we figured we we touch on some of the highlights you know, out of Flowery Branch with mini camp being last week uh, from June eighth to June tenth. Uh, an OTA session wrapped up uh, on Monday. Like I said, the last one open to the media, but. Figured we'd touch on the highlights. So we'll start first with uh, some of the absences. And there weren't many, which is a good thing um, when you're dealing with mandatory mini camps and all that surrounds that. Uh, but there's a few to talk about. The first one uh, is notably Calvin Ridley, the new wide receiver one in Atlanta, uh, has missed mini camp uh, due to a minor foot procedure done. Uh, to clean up an issue that he kind of dealt with throughout the 2020 season. Uh, Again, the hope, and and Calvin did have a media session uh, today, uh, Tuesday, and he does expect to be back at training camp. He didn't sound, you know, completely 100% on that, but it it does sound like if he would miss, it wouldn't be more than a week or two. So certainly uh, something to keep tabs on because, again, uh, with the Julio departure now, you know, there's if you're creating a list of most important Falcons on the team, obviously it starts with quarterback Matt Ryan, but I, I think Calvin Ridley uh, would be close behind as, as number two now as he emerges, you know, as that go-to weapon uh, in the Falcons offense. Uh, another one, um, not injury-related, but uh, due to a personal matter, Deion Jones um, was excused from minicamp. Uh, hopefully everything's good with Dion, uh, you know, in his personal life. Um, you know, if he is dealing with a loss, you know, our thoughts and prayers are out with him. But, you know, hopefully he takes the necessary time to grieve with that, uh, clears his head, because, uh, again, he's going to be an important piece of that Dean Pease defense, uh, a defense that likes to blitz the linebackers, and it's a role we saw Dion play uh, quite a bit, uh, you know, when, when Raheem Morris took over last year, and, and I would expect more of the same under Pease. Um, another one, Dante Fowler, uh, he was present, um, but there was some concerns that maybe, uh, he wouldn't be due to the whole contract situation. He did take a pay cut, uh, you know, in the off season, uh, to free up some salary cap space. But again, just wanted to touch on him because all reports out of camp were that, you know, he looked in great shape. Um, so, you know, he didn't waste his time, uh, away from the building when he wasn't you know, present for OTAs. And again, he's going to be an important piece. Uh, we talked at length uh, on previous podcasts about the depth at edge, and it's not great. Dante is the one guy you can look at and say, yeah, that, you know, that's a starting edge rusher. If not an edge one, you know, he'd be an edge two on, on a good amount of teams. Um, again, we're going to need to rely on him heavily. So again, good to, good to hear that he, he looks in great shape because again, he did battle injuries. Uh, in 2020. Uh, the notable one I want to talk about, I'm going to throw you guys away and obviously, you know, touch on any of the others I just mentioned, but Caleb McGarry has been a noticeable absent uh, absentee throughout camp and not a lot of media attention has picked it up. Uh, apparently d did ask a question about it and Arthur Smith kind of gave, you know, his typical coach speak answer saying, you know, Caleb's doing what he needs to be doing. But with, with him out and Matt Gano also being out, that has bumped Jalen Mayfield uh, to play in a good amount of right tackle, which for me there's a level of concern there because the plan for Mayfield is to be the left guard. If not the left guard, uh, you know, on day one, the left guard of the future. And for me, if, if Mayfield's having to spend his time filling in 
uh, for McGarry and Gano, you know, that's taken away from his development at left guard. Uh, and, and it's going to prolong this, this, you know, projection that I think some of us are concerned about there because Mayfield's never played guard. And now, you know, playing a position he's, he's accustomed to, you know, again, he's not really growing in, in the role, uh, that the Falcons drafted him, you know, 68th overall for. So I wanted to get your your guys' thoughts. What do you think of the whole situation? What do you think it means, Jake? I'll, I'll go to you first as far as McGarry's absence. Are you concerned uh, not only that he's out, but also it might be taken away from Mayfield being that day one starter at left guard? Uh, yeah, I definitely think there's some concern with Mayfield. But as far as McGarry goes, it's one of those things where I can really only concern myself with the guys that are actually there. Alex, what do, you, what do you make of uh, the Mayfield, oh, yeah. the Gary? I think it's, it's really important to always remember that these guys are in shorts. Uh, there's plenty of prominent, more important players around the league that aren't in attendance to their teams, OTAs. Uh, you would love to have all your guys there. I mean, especially the ones that are, you know, like McGarry, who are still developing. There's no questions about it. He needs every rep he can get. But, you know, he could have a slight injury just like Calvin Ridley just had getting something cleaned up, you know. Or he could be, just like Jake said, you know, doing his own private workouts. Uh, I don't think it's really anything to, you know, get worked up about just yet. Uh, and then as for Mayfield's, um, uh, his own development, yeah, you would like him to take all these snaps probably where he's going to be. Uh, but, again, I point to the rest of the league that, uh, if you saw some of the starting fives that teams are rolling out, you'd be like, what? that guy's a left guard through and through. Why is he at right guard? You know, I think teams just play around and see what kind of resilience resiliency these guys have. Um, yeah, you'd love him at left guard so he can just hit the ground running and hopefully start week one like I assume he will. Uh, but again, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't think too much on this. It's probably nothing. Or it could be something, but I I really doubt it. I really doubt it. Yeah, I could, and I could be wrong, but I think he is there, uh, you know, on the field. He's not away from the building. It's just he's he's been off to the side. And, again, not a lot's been made of it. Hopefully we, we get more answers uh, leading up to training camp. But the one concern that I have is, is that heart issue that McGarry experienced, you know, during his high school and and collegiate career and then experienced a little bit in his first summer with the team. Uh, And and he got off to a slow start, Uh, still, you know, was present uh, in week one, um, which, you know, credit to him for working his way back in after missing some time. But that's my one concern in the back of my head with him and this missed time and the fact that they've kind of been mum about it is it's something, you know, sprout up you know, in the medical, you know, retest uh, in the summer here with this new coaching staff. That's for uh, sure so I, concerning. That is concerning. And I yeah. did forget about that. That's, you know, definitely something to monitor. Right. Uh, and what's horrible is <laughs> during this time, you know, coaches don't have to say anything they don't want to say, you know, uh, yeah. basically, you know, we'll get into it later. Yeah, we will. Yeah. just been mom. Uh, but they, he's not required like he is during the regular season to, um, tell exactly what is going on with the guy's injuries wise. So, you know, right. That's something to monitor for sure. That's concerning. Yeah. So uh, the next, you know, notes and takeaways I, I wanted to touch on is, is some of the players that obviously, are, you know, fans are going to have a lot of interest in, you know, players that are going to be important for the success of this team in 2021. And I, I think uh, start no, no other place than uh, the Falcons' marquee addition this offseason, that being fourth overall pick, Kyle Pitts. And, you know, we had Aaron Freeman on the show uh, last week. If you haven't checked that out, please do. Great interview with him, as always. You know, he, he made the point, and he's absolutely right, that Kyle Pitts, you know, kind of the, the weight and the success of the Falcons offense in 2021 does kind of square folly on his, you know, you know, fall squarely on his shoulders. Uh, now I, I will preface by saying again, for, for me, point number one, as far as can this unit be successful in 2021 is how quickly they get off the ground, how quickly, you know, the pieces uh, in place adapt to Arthur Smith and his scheme. But right after that, it's Kyle Pitts again, you know, with the recent trade of Julio Jones, 
uh, there's a huge void that needs to be filled. You know, we know we know what we can get from Calvin Ridley. We saw it. We saw him emerge. You know, as a 1,300 plus yard receiver last year. You know, in Julio's you know absence while he was out, and that was myth. That was with missing one game. Uh, so there's really no concern there. There's there's not a lot of concern with guys like Russell Gage, Hayden Hurst. If they give you the production that they gave you last year, I think you're going to be okay with that. Uh, I you know we both we all did kind of mention that we expect Russell Gage uh, to potentially take a leap and maybe be a thousand yard receiver. I, I wouldn't put it past them. But you know again, there. It, those guys are really going to be the role players. They need a number two option to step up. And that's where Kyle Pitts, you know, kind of comes into play and, and hearing, you know, the reports that he's being used all over the field and he's being heavily targeted, you know, that, that isn't to be overstated because again, the rapport between quarterback and receiver is huge. And when you insert a new guy and like that, you know, that takes time. I think we even saw it. I saw it last year quite a few times on tape with Hayden Hurst. The, the rapport and chemistry wasn't always there and the trust wasn't there despite, you know, Hayden doing his job. It's just Matt is still working through that chemistry. So with Kyle, they can't really afford that one year, you know, holding period or grace period. They, they need, they need it to happen right away. So to see Kyle get heavily targeted, to hear that he's being used all over the field, which is what you would like and expect out of Arthur Smith. When you get a unicorn, when you get a chess piece like Kyle Pitts, I mean, that's great to hear. Um, another point, uh, Scott Baer, the new uh, managing editor of the Falcons website, he wrote an article following A.J. Terrell around. I think A.J. Terrell uh, is yeah. going to be very important. You know, we talked about it on last week's Just Stop Tweeting segment. You know, there's not a lot to like about the cornerback depth chart in Atlanta, uh, but A.J. Terrell is is one of the things uh, that you love about it. and you know, Scott kind of followed uh, AJ around on day two of mini camp. And what jumped out to him uh, was the confidence level. And again, keep in mind, we're we're talking about a guy, Scott Bear, who's brand new to the organization, doesn't know a lot about them coming in. Uh, So to to hear something like that, I I think that's noteworthy. And again, cornerbacks and confidence, they need to go hand in hand in order to be elite cornerback. Uh, it's one of the things I look for. It's one of the things I noted in, in J.C. Horn, that swagger and confidence. That's what you look for from a cornerback one. And, and to see it from Terrell and to hear Scott talk about how smooth he looks in and out of his breaks, you know, it's very exciting. Again, uh, Alex, you pointed out about, again, we're just in shorts and, and you know, uh, no pads or anything. But, again, stuff like that, uh, confidence level, uh, you know, s- smoothness you know that that translates whether you're in pads or not and again i'm expecting a huge year too uh which is often the year that that players make a leap and again it's good to hear uh from from an outsider who's now kind of learning uh the personnel it's it's good to hear you know him say that about aj uh another one i want to touch on um again before i get into one that i'm sure we'll spend a little bit of extra time on uh, is michael walker Uh, he's one of those guys that you know, I'm most excited uh, to hear and, and watch in the preseason uh, just because, again, uh, his role, you know, might be a little undefined right now. We don't know what, what to expect, whether, you know, are the Falcons going to be a 4-3 base team or, you know, how how varied. I, I know I, I talked about being an amoeba defense. How varied are they going to be? Because if they are truly an amoeba defense under Dean Pease, and, and their looks are going to vary from week to week. You know, a guy like Michael Walker who can play inside, can play edge, played it in college, you know, uh, has shown, shown coverage ability. You know, that, that's a useful – again, we use the term with Kyle Pitts, chess piece, but that's the type of player Michael Walker can be. And him uh, continuing his rookie season trend of creating turnovers, already doing so again this summer – uh, it's good to hear. And, and, and hopefully he's one of those guys I think that's going to kind of sneak under the radar – and can potentially be one of those playmakers that this defense, uh, you know, sorely covets. And then uh, getting into um, Isaiah Oliver, because this got a lot of attention uh, recently on Twitter. Um, On the team website, a couple pictures, and they post pictures every day of the OTA practices, but uh, the team website 
called Isaiah Oliver safety. Now, was that a typo? I, I don't know. NFL.com website also listed him as safety. Are they just piggybacking off of, you know, the, the post that they saw the Falcons uh, website making the pictures? Maybe. Um, but want to get your guys' thoughts on what you think about that. Um, again, with the Amoeba defense, there's going to be guys that are moving all over the field. Uh, and, and maybe that's a byproduct of that, where, where a guy like Isaiah Oliver is going to be in the slot, going to be out wide. Maybe they drop him deep. Uh, and maybe that's what it is. And we, we shouldn't read too much into it like we might have under Dan Quinn when, you know, the, the, the roles were a little bit more defined. You had a single high safety and you had a box safety. Under Dean Pease, that might not apply. But curious to get your thoughts. Do you think it could be a fit? Or what do you, what do you think this means for Isaiah Oliver? Uh, Alex, I'll let you go first on this one. Yeah, I think everybody's just, you know, thinking in ones and zeros and acting like computers. You know, they see safety and they think he's, you know, going to be this center fielder, which he won't, or he's going to be this cam chancellor in the box guy, which he won't. Uh, he's it's it's basically a formality is what I think. It's, it means nothing. It's just funny to look at. And, you know, he's going to be, in my opinion, used as a hybrid player, safety corner. Um, Jeff Ulbrich said, and I quote uh, about Oliver last year, uh, he's a pro- he's proven to be a very good tackler. He's got the ability to support the box, play almost safety-like roles at times. He's got length, the size, willingness, and tackling ability. He's got all of it. During the 2018 season, Dean P's dialed up personnel package packages on 73% of defensive snaps, 73. That's such an overwhelming majority of snaps coming with more defensive backs on the field. So think of it like this, you know, big nickel is basically when you take a linebacker off the field and you bring a defensive back on, it's usually a safety. Hence the big part of the nickel. Regular nickel is when you bring a cornerback on instead of a safety. Uh, So it's just going to be completely situationally based. Say, you know, a smaller tight end uh, the opposing team has, maybe Isaiah Oliver does best against him. Or a bigger slot receiver, maybe he does best against him. Like a Terrence Marshall, who, you know, is big and uh, he's not slow by any means, but he's definitely not as quick and agile as, you know, a Scotty Miller. Um, So I think it's just going to be completely situational and the whole safety thing. People – Particularly Aaron. Aaron seems fired up about uh, Isaiah Oliver being listed as a safety. And and I get it. He would be. That's not his place as a deep third safety. You know, that's not what they're going to ask him to do. And if they do, that's, you know, flawed coaching right, right there. Right. Uh, I think they're going to put him exactly where he needs to be. Uh, and it just so happens to be it's a little bit more closer to safety than it was corner like last year. It's just in between. I mean, you know. Get, everybody needs to get their panties out of their ass. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. They, people were in arms about this. Like, I, I, I guess like people see the uh, the term free safety, and they probably just immediately equate it in their mind to you know an Earl Thomas who's just roaming on the back, which is not what he's going to do. You know, I just think, just like you said, it's going to be amoeba defense. It's going to vary week to week based on matchups. Uh, you know, one week it could call for Darren Hall to be the starting nickel. One week it could be Isaiah Oliver. One week it could be Eric Harris because we need more uh, meat in the box. Like, I mean, it's just going to be just like you said, it's going to be very fluid. It's going to be a very fluid defense. Uh, the personnel calls for it, too. So that's, you know, I think it's just being overblown. It's just a formality. Yeah, I think you summed it up well. Jake, anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, different teams have different names for this position. Uh, Star, Joker, Rover, uh, Badger, Jackal, whatever the hell they want to call it. It's a guy that follows around tight ends and bigger receivers. And like Alex said, I pretty much think that's what Oliver's going to be listed to. I do want to say shout out to Alex because he got absolutely just destroyed for saying this exact same thing back in February. (laughs) And here we are. We had people comment. Falcon fans just don't understand how safety play works. Like, no, dude, you probably moved Isaiah Oliver to free safety in Madden and he dropped three overall and you just thought it was a bad idea. <laughs> People just don't know what they're talking about, but, I mean, that's Twitter for you. But. Yeah, and again, I think they just have to get that whole idea of, you know, what a free safety 
you know, from previous defenses is. I mean, again, Alex said it. They probably think it's an Earl Thomas type when, when they hear that. But that, again, that's not going to apply to Dean Pease's scheme. Uh, I think you're going to see more of the same that you saw towards, you know, the tail end of 2020 where, you know, as Jeff Obrick said it, it's like a hybrid uh, safety corner role. He's a good tackler, which again, that that's one of the best things I think you can probably say about Oliver is, is uh, his work in the run support, uh, which is again, uh, a characteristic you look for in safeties is their ability to defend the run. Corners can get away with it at times. Safeties can't. And again, he, he's a he's a bigger guy, uh, so he he can match up on some of those tight ends, I think. And again, there, you know, I, I keep bringing up this Logan Ryan uh, comparison. I like it a lot for Isaiah Oliver, and I think Logan Ryan was a guy that was moved around and and had some of his best years under Dean Pease, and these uh, Pease brought him on the blitz quite a bit. So I think you're going to see a lot of that from from Oliver, which again. Uh, you see from safeties a lot, you know, coming down in the box, blitzing off the edge. So again, it's not, it's not what you think when, when you hear uh, him being labeled as a safety, if, if this is in fact true, or again, this could be just one big typo and the NFL.com followed suit on it. But uh, if, if he is in fact a safety, it, again, it's going to be a hybrid role. He's going to, he's going to be uh, inside a lot, which again, uh, safeties, uh, especially the strong safeties tend, tend to do creep down are, are in the box. But again, I, I'd like to bring up too, uh, you know, the athletic kind of reported uh, early on in OTAs and, and their initial uh, defensive look was that Isaiah Oliver was in the nickel and, you know, Fabian Morrow was, was the other cornerback out wide uh, with uh, AJ Terrell on the opposite side. So it, again, you can call Oliver, uh, you know, as, as Alex said, a big nickel safety in, in that, in that look. Um, but, you know, again, it, it can be interchangeable. I mean, nickel, big safety, I, I don't think it matters a whole lot. So again, yeah, I'm, I'm with the consensus here, the group. I, I think it's a lot to do with nothing and what you call different, different players uh, for a defense like this is kind of irrelevant, but um, last point or any, anything you guys want to add on any other players I touched on before I move I on do to want the to one say time. something that uh, I yeah, think go ahead. I, I would just, I can't, I have to say this. It's really not that important, but. I think the comparison to Logan Ryan as a role is like spot on. That's a good comp, you know, as the role that Logan Ryan played in. But I, Isaiah Oliver is not Logan Ryan. No, uh, Aaron yeah, pointed yeah. that out to me saying. on Twitter. Yeah. I'm trying to clarify to the audience. Basically, Matt yeah. is not comparing Isaiah Oliver yeah. to Logan Ryan. Moreover, just the role that Logan Ryan right. played in DPs. Right. And again, keep in mind, Oliver was much, much better. People like to forget about it because he was bad in his other role, but he was much, much better when moved in the slot, when playing this hybrid role at the end of 2020. So, hey, I, I don't think the book is totally written on him. I know others uh, said, you know, he's a lost cause. Um, and again, we'll, we'll see. I mean, this is a huge year for him uh, because he's in a contract year. Uh, if, if he finds a home in this role, you know, maybe, maybe he's a piece that they look to, to extend, but uh, Oliver's uh, a lightning yeah. rod. He's the guy that fans really like to, to dislike. He really and is. Every time he, every time he does something wrong, everybody's on his neck about it. He's, he's, he was average at worst for the last few games of the year in that nickel role. And I think he was pretty good at times, but it, as soon as he does something wrong, as soon as he gets beat, as soon as he splits up, everybody's on him. I don't know if it's because the expectations were so high on him. Uh, coming out of the draft, oh, yeah. I thought he was a great pick at the time. I don't know if that's the reason, but I mean, he's just a lightning rod, and you know, no, uh, hopefully he is. can hopefully he can prove a lot of people wrong this year. I guess we'll see. Yeah, I mean that that's the pressure of being you know a second round pick, um, and you know there he was getting some some first round buzz. I remember in that class, and that's why I think everyone you know was jumping up and down that that we got him when we did because again, some teams were looking at him at the end of round one, and then it doesn't help that you know, guy that I liked better. And I, and I think some other people did, and he's turned out to be a pretty good pro Carlton Davis from uh, Tampa Bay. 
has turned out to be a much better pro right now. So that doesn't help his cause. But, yeah, he's a lightning rod because of the pressure and because when he does slip up, uh, it looks really bad. But uh, moving on to one other point out of mini camp before we move on to some other topics. Uh, there was a signing. Uh, it wasn't the signing that I think a lot of fans hoped for when when a roster spot opened up after the Julio Jones trade. But Falcons did end up signing one of their tryout players. They brought in five. Uh, he is an edge guy, Jeff Holland, 2018 undrafted player out of Auburn. So he fills that 90th roster spot left vacant by Julio. Again, not the signing that I think a lot of fans wanted, but I, I think it points to the direction of, you know, any of this cap space that the Falcons uh, have received now. And again, they received about 15 million plus uh, from the Julio trade. It's it's probably not going to go where you think it's going to go. Uh, and, and a couple points I want to hit on um, before I get your thoughts on Holland. Uh, Again, in the offseason, it's all about top 51 contracts. So the top 51 highest contracts are what hits the salary cap and accounts for the salary cap space. But when you get to week one, you have to have guys 52 and 53 signed, and you have to have your practice squad, which, again, if the NFL adopts the practice squad rules that they adopted last year in the COVID season, then you're looking at 16 players under contract. Uh, now again, they don't get paid the same amount as veteran minimum, but they, you know, they get paid uh, a decent amount, um, and roughly that's going to account for three to four million. So you're talking about three to four million uh, from practice squad guys, fifty-two and fifty-three. Again, they're generally vet min guys. So let's just, for the sake of argument, say the combined cost is one point five million. So right there, you have five point five million of your 8.5 million that you're going to have left over that we kind of reported on last week after this, after the draft class is, is fully signed. That's 5.5 of the 8.5. And that's not even taken into account any sort of uh, emergency fund, which generally runs three to 4 million to sign players throughout the year due to injury and whatnot. So again, I, I don't think, you know, basically don't get your hopes up for any marquee signings. A guy like uh, Justin Houston or Melvin Ingram, they're not playing for one to two million. They're, they'll sit out before they do that. So, really, if there's any sort of player uh, that I think has a shot, and again, I, I go back to that left guard position because that's that's the one that I still think is unanswered, and there's still a lot of questions right now. Josh Andrews is the presumptive starter if the season started tomorrow, which is kind of a scary thought. I, I think a guy like again Nick Eason. Uh, formerly of the Saints, so there's a Terry Fontenot connection. The center guard, you know, has has a good amount of experience. Again, not a great player, um, but a veteran, replacement level starter. I trust him over Josh Andrews uh, to play at left guard. So that would be the one name I'd throw out there. But again, it wouldn't shock me if they really like Andrews because it does sound like that. But again, just wanted to bring that up. Uh, because, you know, while the Holland signing probably means nothing in the grand scheme of things, I think it does point to the fact that uh, the team is probably going to kind of sit on their hands and, and roll any cap space over into the season, if not into 2022. But um, anybody got any takes on, on Jeff Holland uh, out of Auburn? <laughs> is he a guy that could potentially, with, with this uh, depth chart being what it is at edge rusher, can, can he surprise and maybe be the fifth guy that they take? I remember who he is. I guess that's a good thing. I mean, I watched I watched a decent amount of Auburn games. I think he had over 12 sacks one of his years. Uh, him and Marlon Davidson are probably friends. And there's your scouting report from me on him because I kind of forgot about the guy until a few weeks ago. So yeah. he wore number four. I do remember that. He was a single-digit guy, so that automatically probably adds like two or three sacks to, to a season total. I mean, the, Bron the Broncos, he, he was an undrafted guy out of Denver, I believe, right? I mean – yeah. Going to a spot I think like he got that a big was, contract from them. Yeah, I mean, so it says there's something there for a guy like Vic Fangio and all of his experiences being a you know defensive mastermind. Saw enough in you to to take a chance. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly a, a guy to keep an eye on because again, edge is one of those spots where we we talked about it when we went through the undrafted players. Uh, you know, earlier on. Uh, in the off season, 
Um, there's opportunity there. I mean, Dante Fowler is locked in. You know, Kiki Mingo uh, is, is locked in. Stephen Means is locked in. But beyond that, you know, JTM, I, you know, I'd say he's the edge four right now, but he's not locked in anything. Um, Adi Ogundeji, I guess, is going to play in that role. I don't think he's a fit in that role. Um, hopefully he proves me wrong. So, again, th- there's opportunity there. Uh, but also, again, uh, if this defense really is an amoeba defense, guys like Michael Walker might might get some time along the edge. Uh, you know, so, Alex, anything to add on Jeff Holland? A- anything? Uh yeah, at the edge guys uh, basically his ceiling is you know depth that's basically yeah. what he is uh i think the m- most interesting thing is he's a big guy with a small number thank you jake i didn't know that i love defensive linemen in small numbers single digit number defensive linemen are like up there with the greatest you know trinity of football just you know wings beer Big guys in small numbers. I mean, I love that. Yeah, but I think that you hit it like right on the head. I mean, they're not going to spend much money anywhere else. So if anybody is brought in, it's going to be somebody like this who's just depth. Uh, of course, unless, you know, emergency injury, something like that happens. But, yeah, I'd, I'd, I would be, you know, talking out of my ass if I said anything really about him. I know he, you know, played a little bit in Denver his rookie year. Had a couple of tackles, but uh, pretty much just depth. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 got, I will say uh, I could see them making a trade, but that's maybe something we can talk about next week since we're uh, since we're just hitting OTAs. Maybe some guys they could target in a trade. I don't know if they would. I know you brought up Taylor Rapp a lot. I don't know if they'd go for somebody uh, like that at this point, but yeah. Who knows? Yeah, that that's like the Malik Hooker dream. I think I've given up on that one too, but that would be great because, again, I – you know, getting a, a safety uh, on the same timeline as Richie Grant to pair with, um, that would be awesome. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're still in the evaluation process with a lot of these guys too. And maybe if they do make moves, it's it's at the end of training camp um, to kind of solidify the roster if guys aren't, you know, showing up the way that they hoped. Um, so, again – something to monitor. But as of right now, I think uh, I wouldn't expect any free agent moves uh, leading up to training camp. I think as far as the Grady Jarrett restructure, you know, after the Julio Jones trade, I think they're going to just table all of that until uh, next year when they'll likely extend him to create cap space. Um, Next topic I want to get into, and it's one I know Jake's been uh, a bit outspoken about, so I'm going to give him the floor in a sec. But it, it's early impressions on Arthur Smith. Uh, you know, we've now probably heard him a handful of times on the mic in his media sessions, and it's a completely different uh, vibe than what you got from Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn, you got you know upbeat, energetic, uh, all the puns, all the all the mottos, all the all the sayings, which I know grew old amongst the fan base with Arthur Smith. It's no nonsense. It's, it's monotone. He's like a stone wall. there, just giving you the, you know, almost Belichickian answers. Um, and I mean, he's, he's been big on the accountability. Uh, we've heard it. Uh, that's one of the things that's gotten reported a lot is players having to take laps when they mess up and commit penalties. Um, that's definitely, you know, uh, a, again, a different vibe, a, a breath of, fresh air, I guess you could say almost more like the Mike Smith air too, because he was, uh, he was big on the details and big on getting stuff right. I don't think he ever made guys take laps. Um, but you know, this type of, uh, coaching can work or it it cannot work. And, you know, one way it it starts to to get old is if you're not winning, you're not having success. And I, I know we saw it, uh, in Detroit with Matt Patricia. So, Jake, I'll give you the floor, some opportunity to, to maybe uh, elaborate more on the apprehension. Is that your concern that Arthur Smith uh, becomes, you know, a Matt Patricia? Yeah, let me preface this by saying this is not an indictment and this is not be, me being pessimistic. I'm just I was just kind of making a point when I was talking about this on Twitter. You know, uh, it's, it's great. You know, people love it at first. Everybody's like, oh, you know, he's 
he's, you know, getting back to running Oklahoma drills and doing all this and all this stuff. And it's like, that doesn't work all the time. You know, it, you have to win. Um, if you look at the New York Giants, Joe Judge did a lot of this last year. It was raising a lot of eyebrows. Everybody was talking about, oh, Matt Patricia, you know, Matt Patricia tried to be Belichick. You know, it's not. It kind of started coming around for Joe Judge, and the Giants started winning some games, and they probably should have made the playoffs. They, you know, we won't we won't go into that. But even Tom Coughlin, you look at Jacksonville, man. You know, I know he wasn't the coach, but every single player in that build wanted out. Yannick Ngakwe wanted out. Jalen Ramsey wanted out. Um, you know, just to name a few. Uh, it's 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 a cultural thing, and I like it. I'm a big fan. I love the answers he's given so far. He's not he's not entertaining the nonsense. He's not he's not taking all these questions about Julio Jones. You know, it, I, I appreciate that. You know, at a time like now when it feels like things are getting ridiculous a lot, uh, around, you know, the questions that are getting asked around training camp and Arthur Smith is you know dot dot man. It's just one of those things where it's a boomer bust strategy, and it can go south a lot quicker. Uh, as opposed to a guy like Dan Quinn, who was, you know, a cheerleader and all the players really liked him. Well, it's really, it's a lot easier to fire a guy when your players think the coach is, uh, coach is a hardo, you know, and you know, you're two years into a guy that they don't like, or you're two, two years into Dan Quinn when they're like, no, 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 you can't get rid of him. You can't get rid of him. It's a boomer bust strategy, but I think it's going to work for him, but it's, uh, it's something you definitely, uh, can definitely get you run out of town pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a results business in the end. So if they're not getting the results, uh, yeah, I agree. It can get you run out of town pretty quickly. Uh, Alex, curious to get your th- thoughts and initial impressions on Arthur, you know, being kind of an outsider, a non-Falcons fan uh, covering the team. Yeah, um, I think that Jake, you know, pretty pretty much hit it on. The only thing is uh, it's all about winning. Like, nobody would put up with Bill Belichick's shit if they didn't win. Nobody. I mean, it's one of those things, just like you said, the Lions didn't win and players started to question what they were doing. Um, So I think that, you know, I would rather have somebody like Smith more so than Quinn, who's a rah-rah guy. Uh, But I think there's a fine line. Like, Dan Campbell – is coming out doing these crazy things, acting like a hardo. He wore a motorcycle helmet to a uh, to a media session. Imagine what he's doing behind closed doors if he's doing this in front <laughs> of the. Hall. I mean, he that yeah. must be. I mean, must watch TV if you could get a camera. In oh, it is. Aside, it is. Aside aside from that, you know, it's all about results. It literally doesn't matter. Vince Lombardi, military guy, you know probably the hardest coach on his players, Tom Coughlin, military guy, you know, so hard on their players, but they win. I mean, Michael Strahan is so outspoken about how his relationship with Coughlin was really bad at one point, finding him for, you know, practice stuff, you know, uh, not being 15 minutes early, stuff like that. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. So that can be annoying, but then you win Super Bowls and, you know, it's really hard to equate all the things players have to do like running laps uh if you told julio jones to go run a lap and you were julio jones you'd be like dude i'm not going to run a lap like i'm the best there is you know so there is a certain you know you have to be humble and i bet arthur smith's just doing this he's a rookie head coach you know he's trying to act a little hard and earn some of these guys respects probably so you know i think it just matters if he wins. If he wins, the players will be like, yeah, this is a good culture. And if he doesn't win, then they'll be like, you know, st- st- you're just yeah. being weird. You know, you're being quirky and weird and just tough for no reason. You know, there's all, it, I think it just depends on winning. Honestly. Right. Something else, something else I will point out to you is like, we've seen Arthur Smith interview on like busting with the boys and stuff. Like he's a funny guy. Like yeah, he, yeah, exactly. he, he he has a personality. So he's I a very like, fantastically funny guy. I think like yeah, you know, so I feel like he's pretty chummy around the guys. Like I don't think he's like some dictator walking around there twenty four seven. I feel like he's still a cool guy and he's fun to be around. But when he steps out on the field, it's all business, and I like that a lot. Right, right, and, and again, I don't with the lap stuff. Like I don't know what else is is going on in practices, but. um Again, I don't. I don't think you know football. You have to run. I mean, <laughs> you run in football. There's conditioning in football. Uh, so again, when you commit a penalty, I mean, you should expect to be punished a little bit. So 
I, I'm okay with it. I, I loved a lot of his answers that he's given thus far in some of the press conferences. A couple ones, you know, that jumped out to me was, and this is one I think uh, earns you respect in the locker room right away is when, you know, they kept pushing and pushing on the Julio stuff. You know, his, his insistence on keeping all those matters private, uh, I, I think was big time. Um, you know, talking about how, you know, if you don't like problems, stay out of leadership roles. I mean, that's huge. He, he's putting it all on him. Um, and again, he just, it's not a surprise that he's the son of a, of a big CEO of a fortune 500 company. Cause it, he just acts and talks like he's been in this environment kind of his whole life and kind of knows, um, you know, what's to come, knows what answers is to come and kind of has a response for it. And again, um, he, he's not going to give you any more than he wants to give you. I think he's very calculated in his approach. So I, I'm cool with it. But again, uh, I know all, all of this can grow very stale and old if you're not getting the results. But I also think he realizes that too. And he's not, again, part of the no nonsense is just, hey, I'm, I'm here to get these guys right. Uh, you know, it's all about accountability. It's all about, you know, doing your job, not, not to steal another Belichick quote, but um, I, I think that's what's led to all this that you're seeing right now. And I, I think he'll probably open up a little bit more as, you know, he he gets comfortable and, again, they start having some success. But right now it's all about getting the guys ready and he realizes that. So, yeah, um, I, I don't worry. I don't worry about players I never coached was the perfect answer to all of those. Julio yeah, Jones that's questions. another one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and here in, I don't know if it was in the Atlanta Falcons article recently on their website, but, um, here in the relationship with Matt right now, and again, him, uh, saying that, you know, he likes to give a smart ass answer to Matt every now and then to kind of push his buttons and, and coach him up. I think that's the type of stuff that, um, you know, Matt likes as well. Uh, and Matt will, you know, respond to well, um, so again, it's going to be fun to watch unfold. Uh, it's, you know, one of the reasons I thought uh, he was one of the, the best fits for them of the coaching candidates. Uh, so I'm excited. I, I I think big things are in store. Again, I know uh, as fans, we're kind of uh, conditioned to say that, but I really believe in Arthur Smith and, and what he brings to the table. Um so uh, we'll move on uh, again. This, as as I talked about, I think a show or two ago, that we're getting towards the dead period of the NFL offseason here. So there's less and less to talk about. But figured we'd touch on the preseason schedule release that came out last week. Uh, you know, as many probably know, there's there's only going to be three preseason games on this year's calendar. Uh, and you know, we don't have to wait long, unfortunately. Uh, for Julio Jones's return to Atlanta, because uh, in week one of the preseason, Friday, August 13th, Tennessee is going to uh, roll into Mercedes-Benz Stadium now. Julio's probably not going to play, uh, but I'm curious to get your guys' uh, thoughts on this question. Do you even think he makes the trip? Uh, you know, again, uh, based on the hoopla around this breakup and how abrupt and Again, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. You know, given his stature, there's no concern about him being ready. Uh, do, do you think he might not make the trip? you think that's a possibility? Jake, what do you uh, I, I mean, I think it's possible, but um, I don't see it. It seems like something that's not really his style. I don't think he likes to draw that type of attention. He knows the cameras will be on him the whole game because it's probably going to be a boring game. <laughs> and uh, I just don't see it. But that, but that's the thing. It's like if he's there, he is going to draw all the attention that he probably doesn't want. Again, I, I don't. Yeah. I, I'm not sure what the order of because this is a new schedule uh, of preseason games. Like, what order is the dress rehearsal game, or how how soon? Because I know the starters usually do get a series or two in that first preseason game. I don't know again uh, if that's going to apply in this schedule, but. Again, that those are the things going through my head right now. Is this will even make the trip because of the media attention? And maybe I'm just overthinking this. But uh, again, um, there, there's going to be a lot of attention on him. Uh, I'm sure they're going to ask more and more questions, and he probably knows that. And 
Uh, Alex, do you have any any thoughts on that? Do you, do you see him playing? Do you see yeah, him playing? So, do you see him showing up? What, what what are your thoughts on Julio's return to Atlanta? So it's becoming more and more of a trend, and it's you know more with the younger coaches or the you know more you know coaches are just willing to not let their star players play at all in the preseason games. Uh, so that is a factor. You know, I don't know how Mike Vrabel is. Uh, he definitely seems like the kind of guy to demand everybody plays. Uh, but again, he's Julio Jones, and you know. He probably won't play in the preseason. Um, but I think he knows that it's a bigger story if he doesn't show up than if he does. That's fair. So he would go. Uh, he's also – team. I mean, he's a teammate first guy. I mean, he yeah. loves his team. Uh, he wants to be there for his guys. I'm sure he's already got a little – a couple of uh, fringe wide receivers in Tennessee that he's already under his wing and learning from. Uh, so he'll, he enjoys teaching as much as he enjoys playing. I mean, he taught uh, Calvin Ridley everything, not everything, but, you know, a lot. Uh, So I think he he cares about the guys and he'll be there. Uh, So I don't think it's that big of much. It it, it is news because, you know, it's Julio Jones and the Falcons. It's kind of ironic. It's the preseason game, first preseason game. He's already coming back. Uh, But I think it'll be a – it'll pretty much be a non-story. Uh, who knows, though? He could play, and that would be so fun to watch A.J. Terrell and him go at it. Uh, but I think sure. something that's kind of interesting is the, uh, uh, is the following week. Uh, they, the Dolphins and Falcons play in the second preseason game, but they've already announced that they're uh, going to practice, do joint practices that week. So that is so interesting because I think we talked about it a few episodes back about how that's a good benchmark, you know. Uh, a, a borderline elite defense uh, and a at least a threatening offense. Tua is yet to be, you know, determined how good he is, but they have the weapons around Tua for him to be good. Uh, and they have a couple of pieces along the offensive line that'll be a good uh, benchmark for some of our edge rushers. So I think that would be interesting. And I always love joint practices because the guys get in fights and it's just entertaining. <laughs> I love the joint practices. Yeah. You know, competitive juices in like a non traditional setting is awesome to me. Apparently, yeah. to, uh, uh, to a turn the ball over, he threw like two picks today. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I got a lot of headlines it. today. Yeah. It's interesting because um, uh, Jim, Jim Nagy. The, the senior bowl uh, executive director, he made an interesting point. He, he quote tweeted uh, the tweet that basically announced to the world that Tua had five INTs in practice. And, you know, Jim said that, you know, that's part of the reason teams like to limit media access to these practices. And I, I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, I, I guess there is some merit to that point that when media has access to it, they tweet something like that and it gets overblown. And, you know, I, I'm reminded of of the time uh, Matt Ryan threw a pick to Kyle Shanahan in practice. And I think we all remember that. And that got a lot of attention and became a big running joke and meme. Um, but cu- curious, I mean, again, with, with Falcons content, and it's – it's one of my gripes is that I feel like we don't get enough of the stuff we kind of crave and want as hardcore dedicated fans. Like I want to know who's running with the ones in this practice or who's running with the twos in this practice. I don't want to know like, Oh, Hey, the quarterback threw a couple picks say like in practice in shorts and, and, and no pads, like it, that stuff really doesn't matter. And it, it gets way too much, way too many clicks and way too much attention. And that's what's happening with Tua. I think, and again, you know, when you when you couple the fact that he struggled at times and was benched at times, I get why it's now a story versus an established quarterback doing something like that. But you know, media access, I think, is is huge, and uh, you know, I I wish the Falcons had more media access than they do um, because, again, we don't. I don't think we get the necessary content uh, that we need that I think some fan bases get, but. That's kind of just my tangent on that. I, I don't know if you guys want to add anything. I mean, do you think media access is bad at times because of the clickbait stories like the Tua stuff? Or you know, what are your thoughts I don't there? Know. It's a, I, I'm not a Tua believer. Uh, it has nothing to do with me being a student in Georgia, but that's not a story for the podcast. I'll tell you that <laughs> one later. But 
you know, really, I kind of like, I, I like the the drama, the the build up. You know, what gets it gets people fired up a little bit. And you know, obviously, we have a job to do over at Sports Talk ATL. We don't clickbait or anything like that. But you know, sometimes we want to hear about stuff like that too. You know, we're fans too. You know, even if we don't want to cover it, you know, sometimes that stuff's interesting. Maybe somebody and somebody else got a little bit of a scuffle. Uh, you know, so you know, you like that stuff as football fans. It's fair. Yeah, I think there's a fine line. You know, uh, as a football fan in general, I think I. I feel confident in saying for all football fans, we always want more. Like, there's no question that we always want more. We want more football. We want more all year long. Football fans want football. So any anything that we can get, I mean, hard knocks could be a, a seriously, I mean, such a big thing if we got, even if it's a season later, I don't get why it's a big deal that some coaches are just not behind it. It's such a cool thing for the fans to experience. And I get there's a competitiveness, you know, uh, you want to stay secretive or whatever it is, you know, basically you don't want, I don't even know, but well, yeah, if I mean, everybody has it, then, you know, it's a fair playing field. Well, that, that, like, no, that's exactly right. And I think that's what it takes to get to probably get more of that content. I mean, you look at some of those uh, on YouTube, some of the teams doing like leading up to the draft type docu series. So I know cool. the Browns. That's great content. I love that stuff when they kind of take you behind the curtain a little bit, show you a little bit of their process. That's yeah. awesome stuff. And I think in order for us to get to that point, I think you're right, Alex. I think kind of every team kind of needs to just say well, yes to it. I think what's going to happen is the NFL realizes, you know, oh, we're leaving money on the table, and yeah, then they'll just are. force they'll just force it down the team's throats. You know, yeah. this is pretty much not an option. You know, we're doing right. this, and we're going to make a bunch of money on it because they could. I mean, we, that behind the behind the scenes stuff is so cool for so many fans to watch. They yeah. really should look into it more. And we and we finally got a little bit of a taste of it. Falcons did like a little mini movie on their draft. Uh, and that was awesome, and it got <laughs> so much attention, and people are like, we want more, we want more, and I was included in that. So, yeah, I, either the NFL has to, you know, force force it down the team's throats, or, uh, again, it's just a matter of all the teams accepting of it and kind of leveling the playing field because, again, that content does tremendous. And, you know, it's because fans fans want it. Like you said, it's 24-7, 365 football. There, there really is no off-season when it comes to the NFL. It's always on fans' minds. But uh, just to wrap up the preseason schedule breakdown, uh, the only other game we didn't mention, and it's the one primetime game, and I think part of probably the reason that they gave the Falcons, you know, one of, I believe, five primetime preseason games is because they only gave us uh, one primetime game uh, during the 2021 regular season, that being the Thursday night football game against the Patriots. Uh, but they are going to close the preseason uh, on Sunday night, August 29th, 8 p.m. against the Cleveland Browns, which is another tremendous benchmark game uh, team in Cleveland that I'm very high on that I think could challenge uh, the Chiefs for AFC supremacy. I think they're, that, their roster is that good. It just all comes down to Baker Mayfield and his play in year two of the Stefanski offense, but uh, certainly looking forward to this matchup. Kind of want to get your guys' thoughts on the matchup, but also do you think this is the dress rehearsal game or how do you see the dress rehearsal game playing out? Because that's always such a pivotal game on the preseason calendar. Typically it was week three of the four game schedule. Now, since we only got three games, where do you think that falls? Alex, I'll turn it over to you first. Yeah, I don't know. But like I said, I think the trend of letting star players continually sit out all the preseason games is going to become more and more popular. Uh, But I think what's important is any of these three games is going to be great for the starters. You know, any three of them. There's great things on, you know, the Titans offense is, you know, going to be one of the best in the league. The Dolphins defense is going to be one of the best in the league. I mean, they all have the Browns. I mean, both sides of the ball have yeah. got talent everywhere. Yeah. So even if, you know, a Miles Garrett sits out, uh, you know, somebody like that, or Julio Jones sits out, there's plenty of other people on all three of these teams. Uh, that'll be a good, you know, it'll be fun to watch them play, you know, as close to a regular season game as we can get at that point. So it'll be fun. But pr- I, I think, I really do think it's, you know, more and more players, more and more star players aren't going to be participating. But I could be wrong. 
Yeah, I mean, I think preseason is is so pivotal for the younger guys, and the Falcons do have a younger roster than they have had in the last several years. So I expect a good chunk to play. I mean, obviously the guys like Matt, and especially if Calvin's, you know, off of this uh, foot surgery, you know, those guys I think will get some rest. Grady Jarrett will get rest, uh, and Deion Jones. But I expect a lot of the Falcons to play. I'm just curious, you know, which – uh, game is going to be that dress rehearsal game. Jake, you have any thoughts on that or any thoughts on the preseason schedule as a whole? I don't know. I feel like it should be Cleveland. Um, I feel like Cleveland is probably the toughest test on there. If you really want to hit the ground running, uh, that's about a good of an opponent. Uh, good of a, yeah. as an opponent, talent and coaching wise, as you can find. AJ Terrell on Odell Beckham likely. Uh, my guy Greg Newsom and Denzel Ward against uh, Russell Gage and Calvin Ridley. Uh, you know, I, I think that would be a great challenge. Uh, but you can also say the same thing about the Dolphins. And you can honestly say the same things about the Titans. Obviously, they're not going to have a dress rehearsal in the first game. But um, I think I think all three of those teams are, are really great challenges for the Falcons. I think they're all at least slightly better teams right now, um, especially with Arthur Smith just now getting his feet wet. But I feel like talent-wise, the Falcons are on par with, you know, the Dolphins and the Titans. Uh, Miami obviously a little better defensively than offensively, and you would say the reverse for the Falcons. But hey, uh, you know they all bring something a little bit different. Titans got a really good offense. Uh, Dolphins got a really good defense. The Browns are pretty darn good on both sides of the ball. So um, I, I like any of them, but uh, obviously it'll. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say Miami, but I think it probably should be Cleveland. Yeah, my money's on Cleveland just because you know they will have two weeks after that game uh, between. Uh, you know, the end of the preseason, the regular season. And that's typically the time in between uh, the previous dress rehearsal game of week three, um, you know, of, of the old uh, edition of the preseason. So, I, you know, I think it's going to be Cleveland. Uh, it'll also give them a chance to kind of prepare as if they're playing in prime time or they're playing a big game atmosphere. If they were to, to make the playoffs, I think that can go a long way uh, since, you know, they're not going to have, uh, another primetime game until I believe it's week 11 New England on Thursday night. So I- I'll say Cleveland, but I wouldn't be shocked if it was Miami one as well. Uh, I think just because of the joint practices too, you know, they're going to do a lot of, uh, again, they're going to do a lot of prep that week going up against them. So I feel like it makes more sense to do it against the opponent. You're not having the joint practices with, but we'll see. Uh, I-, I think it's a great slate because all three of those teams could be AFC playoff teams uh, in, uh, 2021, uh, you know, I am, I am lower on Tennessee, uh, just because I think Arthur Smith's, uh, departure from them is going to, you know, rock them a little bit harder than the media is, uh, making it out to be, but, uh, we shall see, uh, before we get out of here, cause we're reaching, uh, the hour mark, um, just stop tweeting this week. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a individual, it's not one tweet, but for me, I want to get something off my chest. And I, I just want to make an announcement and say, let people cope with the Julio Jones news the way they want to. You know, we're talking about a franchise icon, been here for the last 10 years. Some people are not just going to forget about him or say, hey, he's not on our team. He's not with us anymore. He's the enemy. Some people aren't going to be like that. I'm one of them. You know, uh, I, I'm trying to avoid the Julio Jones news as much as I can. I have muted both Julio and Julio Jones on Twitter. Still hasn't worked. Uh, so I am still going to probably talk about Julio Jones. Um, you know, what he's meant to this organization, uh, what his departure might mean. So just let people cope with the news as long as they want. Again, he's been here for 10 years. Uh, some people aren't going to just forget about him overnight. Um, so that's my PSA and that's my just stop tweeting of the week is let people talk about Julio if they want to guys, do you have a just stop tweeting or do you want to add anything to that before we hit the road? Yeah. Somebody replied to one of our articles and was like, dude, stop talking about him. He's gone. And I'm like, uh, you start your own page and you can talk about whatever you want, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to reply guys are the worst. Jake. Yeah. I'm going to piggyback on Jake real quick. I mean, I know what you're talking about. It's hilarious to me that people are like trying to say, you know, we should not talk about Julio Jones and Kyle like he's Pitt dead, like he's dead or something. <laughs> yeah, like we're gonna do this all year long. 
compare Julio Jones to Calvin Ridley and Kyle Pitts. This is going to happen all year it's long. It's going to happen. I mean, I don't know what people are like. I think they're just hurt, and I get that. Yeah. You know, I don't have a dog in the fight, so I'm a little bit disconnected from feelings. So I get that, and I can, you know, reason with the idea that people aren't yet, you know. But, guys, he's a grown man, and, you know, grow up. <laughs> you know, basically grow up. It's fun to compare Julio Jones and, you know, what this Falcons offense, this new Falcons offense is going to look like. I mean, it's just silly. It, it those like, exact same people. If Julio comes out and only plays five games all season and is hurt all season, those exact same people will be uh, eating it up that he's not playing well. Yeah. They'll be like, oh, look how much of a bum Julio is now. Yep. Like, they, they, they want it both ways. Yeah. You can't really have it. Yeah, just just hit him with a stop talking about Julio tweet then, just like they did to yeah. you guys. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, again, um, it, the issue is not going to go away. Yes, he's not a member of the Falcons anymore, but uh, he was a big part of it for so long. So it, it's still going to reverberate uh, for probably the rest of the year. Again, uh, unless uh, – and maybe even beyond. Again, if the Tennessee Titans, it, this trade works out for them the way their fans probably hope, and they make the playoffs and they go on a run, we're going to probably still be talking about, you know, what could have been. Like, hey, Julio Jones returned to form. Why couldn't we patch this up type of deal? Uh, it, it's not going to go away. So, you know, do what you can to avoid it. Let people cope the way they want. Uh, that's our PSA of the week. That's our just stop tweeting of the week. Um so yeah, that'll that'll do it for tonight's show. Um, appreciate everyone that tunes into this podcast. Uh, make sure you rate, uh, you subscribe, you leave a comment. We appreciate it all. It, it really does help us out. Um, anything you guys want to plug on the site this week? Uh, I got a Mike uh, Davis fantasy article to look at. I think he could be a sleeper. Uh, yeah. Also, Jake, get into the frame a little bit more. Buy some merch. Show them there. Show them what you oh, got. I got on. you. Yeah. Got Buy the some Aussie merch. chain. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, we'll have. Uh, I definitely annoyed Chase a little bit. Hopefully, we'll have some talking birdie merch maybe in the future. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so be on the lookout for that. But definitely buy uh, some of the merch that they got there. They got some sweet stuff. Definitely like that uh, Georgia golf uh, around Masters time. I know that's past, but definitely like that shirt. That's a cool shirt. Uh, but, yeah, check out all that stuff, guys. And, again, thanks for tuning in. So, for Jake Gordon, Alex Lord, I'm Matt Carley. We're talking birdie. Go Falcons.